Fourteen years ago, three Eastern Cape activists, known as the Pepco Three, were killed at a deserted former police station near Cradock. It is one of the, grues the most gruesome stories we have heard in two years of amnesty applications. This week, Joe Mamasella, self-confessed multiple murderer and excess sky from Flockplas, gave his version of events. He is the only one involved in the killing of the Pepco Three who has not applied for amnesty because he has turned state witness against the other applicants. First, Mamasella first gave his sensational version of the murders at Post Chalmers on this program in April 1996. His story differs from all the other amnesty applicants. It probably means that if the amnesty committee accepts his version, none of the other policemen will receive amnesty. But is Joe Mamasella telling the truth? Let's start right at the beginning of this terrible tale. Champion Golela, Sipo Hashe, and Kakahuli Godelozi were high-profile Eastern Cape activists who disappeared in May 1985 and were never seen or heard from again. Today we know they were abducted from Port Elizabeth Airport by Eastern Cape Security Branch, supported by a contingent of policemen from Flakplas. The purpose, as I can remember, was to remove the three activists from society. The abducted men were brought here to Post Chalmers, 250 kilometers from Port Elizabeth. Today, Post Chalmers is a deserted holiday farm. 14 years ago, it was a disused police station. Post Chalmers is remote and far enough from surrounding farms for activities to be private. This is probably why it was ideal for the Eastern Cape Security Branch to use for interrogations, killings and the burning of bodies. The morning after arriving at Post Chalmers, the policemen started preparing for the interrogation of their prisoners who had been locked in this art building overnight. They were removed from the art building one by one for interrogation and this is where the story starts to diverge. Joe Mamasella, an Askari who was involved in this operation, sings a completely different song to all the other amnesty applicants. He says the men were removed and over the next two days were basically beaten and tortured to death. Their bodies then thrown back into this art building. We faced Mr. Harsha and uh, as the breathless was proceeding, his interrogation started with some ludicrous statements to humiliate him by Lieutenant Nivot at that time. He just grabbed an iron pipe and beat the poor old man several times in his head. And as he did so, all the people joined in. Now, the position of the old man at the time was such that he was in no position to defend himself. And the only thing he could help himself was just to scream out loud. I was then ordered by Lieutenant Nivot to stifle his screams, to put my hands in his mouth and hold it hard, so that his screams mustn't attract the neighboring farmers. As Lieutenant Nivot was beating the old man several times in the head with the iron pipe. I noticed that the blood was oozing from the old man's nostrils and ears, as well as the mouth. And uh, I saw the old man's eyes turning into white pupils. They were turning. It was as if he was fainting or just about to die. The beatings went on and on until I saw the old man laying prostrate on the ground with blood all over his head and, and face. But when I came closer, I noticed that he was also slightly having difficulty with breathing, but he was breathing. I quickly rushed to fetch some water and I just poured the water over him. 
this seemed to revive him. He began to, to talk. But I could see he was not telling the truth. He was merely trying to save himself. And Warren Officer Kole asked him some question. I can't recall the nature of the question at the moment, which was perceived by the old man as a very stupid question. This extremely angered Warren Officer Kole because he instinctively and brutally delivered a mule-like kick on the jaws of the old man. And at the stage, I saw white foam falling from the mouth of the old man. And he slowly collapsed. As he hit the floor, Warren Officer Kole went berserk. And as he strangled him, the others that I've previously named waded in, beating the old man with sticks and beating him with, uh, with iron bars. And the Kole kept on just holding on like a vicious bull terrier on the old man's neck. And it became evident to me that he was dead. And when I looked at Warrant Officer Kole, he was bloodied all over. His clothing, his face, and even his shoes were bloodied. If one looked at him at that stage, one would have sincerely believed that he was the one who was being assaulted. In state, champion Golela was ordered out, and uh, he was subjected to the same brutal treatment that the old man was subjected to. Because of his weak physical body, it was not long before he lay dead. I think his interrogation went on for three to four hours, and then he was dead. We were then ordered that myself, Kole, and Pete Mukhwai should remove these corpses and throw them back into the shed. I saw Godolozi sitting in a corner, at a far corner. He was a pathetic figure. He just stood there, shivering, as if he knew that his fate was just going to come. And uh, the people were praying, they were drinking, College and Pete Mukwai joined on the drinking spree, and uh, they were discussing as if they were discussing about the movie, as if what happened was nothing. Mama Sello spoke very little of his own actions during this torture. This man, who by his own admission helped kill more than 35 people for the security police, today insists that it was all against his will. Griffiths and Nenge, did you do that because you were under duress? Yes, it was in 1981. Yes, and in 1985, in this matter, you got involved because you were acting under duress. Yes, if I did not kill these people, I was going to be killed. It's a fact. More than 10 Askaris were killed for refusing to carry out their, uh, their, their, their duties. And the main, the main duty of Askaris was to kill their mm. own black people. Twelve years, Mr. Momasela, you were part of the security, for, uh, of the security police in South Africa. Is that I right? I was made part of. I was not part of. I was made part of against my will, against my political conviction. Yes, yes we'll get to that. We'll yes. get to that. Yes. Against your political conviction. Yes. So That's what true. was your political conviction then at that time? My political conviction at that time lies entirely with my organization, the African National Congress. Your organization? My organization, full stop. Is that still today your organization? No, 
is no longer my organization because they sold me out on the Boas on a silver platter and then they left me out. Do you know why, why your version in this matter, this PEPCO 3 matter, differs from all the other people who testified here? Yes, it's because I'm telling the truth and they're covering up. The Eastern Cape Security Branch vehemently deny Mamasela's version of how the PEPCO 3 were killed. Captain Van Seyl had for Mnea Haase with a pin 2-2 gewehr geskiet. He had the gewehr on my hand, where I on my beard for Mnea Godelosi geskiet had. And Mnea Lods had for Mnea Galela geskiet. And we had Als het al drie die oorleden is, op die houtstapel geplaas. Their bodies, they say, were burnt and the remains thrown into the fish river at Craddock. The Amnesty Committee will now have to decide who to believe. Because if they accept Joe Mamasella's version of what happened here, the other men are liars and will not get amnesty. But if they accept the versions of Gideon Nivot and the others, then Joe Mamasella's story of what happened here is a lie. The one thing we do know is that three men lost their lives at Post Chalmers.